Change doesn't happen on a dime. It happens in small victories that we celebrate. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. In the show, my guests and I explore how we can use creativity to do our best work and live our best lives. I talk with authors, musicians, actors, scientists, and others who are all pushing the envelope to live fully, creatively, and authentically. Listen in to get the scoop on how you can do it too. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am so excited that you're here. And I'm also excited about my guest this week. She's fabulous. Listen to this. Deb cummins Stellato. she's an igniter of people and organization. She's a certified coach, consultant, speaker, and leadership guru. She brings insight, energy, and experience to individuals and teams looking to be the best versions of themselves. How amazing is that? And she does this with such panache, such style, such heart, such spirit. You're going to love her. Welcome, Deb. I'm so glad that you're here. Yay. I'm so glad I'm here. What a, what a, um, I love panache. I, I don't think that that's a word that I use enough. So thank you for that fantastic introduction. <laughs> it's so true though. You do. You have such style. Ever since the first time I saw you, I was like, this woman, she's got it going on. And, and actually, let, let's chat about that. I'd love to chat just a minute about how we met. We met at Amy Porterfield's Entrepreneur Experience back in what, 2018 or 2019? I actually don't remember now. It would be 18. So it's two years. It'll be two years in August. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Time, time has flown like crazy. Uh, and, and so what brought you there and what was that experience like for you? What brought me there? Um, what brought me there was I was at that time just starting my business. I had, you know, followed this rabbit hole of podcasters. So I had gone from Jenna Kutcher and then I started listening to Amy. I knew I was starting um, a new venture. I had been in the nonprofit world uh, and I had made a decision to make a pivot. And I had a business idea in mind. I was thought I was doing it. Um, I thought I was maybe going to create an online learning platform, which there was a, you know, a lot about that in Amy's stuff, really how to build my online presence. So I went there for that. And um, it was funny. I remember a conversation with you where I was like, one day I think I said, oh, maybe I'll write a book. And then I was like, oh, maybe I'll do a podcast or maybe I'll do this or maybe I won't do a learning thing. And um, I really... I would say that I have gotten a lot of clarity since then about where I'm heading, at least, you know, at this point on May 29th or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, it was such a, a great experience. And the other thing that happened there was I had felt this concern about being the oldest person in the room. And so I'd reached out to people and said, you know, is that anybody else over 50 in this group or is everybody a millennial? And we had formed this group of people who were the 50 somethings, uh, which was fun. And then you and I got put at a table together, our famous table 24 society with this group of women who just happened to click really well. And it was a wonderful experience. It really was. And it's funny how one of the things that I'm noticing right now from that time when we, when we met where it was, it was very inspiring and, and very motivating. But one of the things that I'm noticing is that there are a lot of women in their fifties who are bringing out their entrepreneurial chops and starting off and blazing their own trails. And I think that's incredible. What are your thoughts on that on women sort of maybe even a second career or going back to work outside the home? What's your thought on that on women kicking butt and taking names in that way? Well, I, I'm, I love to think about being a role model for 50 something pivoters. I think it's very exciting. I think there's a freedom to it. I think oftentimes women in midlife are ready to tackle things differently. Um, so it's interesting. I, I just had a call yesterday. I just joined a new co-op and I was fortunate enough to connect with another woman who literally is, she's kind of like my clone. I, I did not expect to meet somebody like this in this collaborative. And she is a 50 something woman, had a huge corporate career, 
um, has done amazing things and decided that she wants to be her own boss and wants to have that freedom that I think when you hit 50, like 50 fearless and freedom all go together. Absolutely. And that kind of pivot, I know that's something that you focus a lot on in your work that that idea of realizing that you want to change and then figuring out how to make that change and you help people do that you list you list yourself and i think it's great as an igniter of people and organizations and i would love it if you would talk a minute about what that means and what do you do to spark these changes in people and organizations well i i came to that because I, I've done a lot of work around core values and what I've learned and what I've owned about myself is that I am pretty good at inspiring people and showing up in with very positive energy. So that's for sure. Was, <laughs> thank you. Um, and so I'm taking that into my coaching practice. I do a lot of work around something called energy leadership, which is, choosing how you show up in life. It's like literally, it. I was using the word igniter before I learned about energy, just happens to all go really, really well together. So really talking about how to consciously decide how you show up as a leader, as a professional, as a team. I do a lot of work like that, mm -hmm. um, using something called an energy leadership index assessment. And then what we're going to talk about is I also do a ton of work around this uh, cognitive diversity uh, where people can really get ignited about thinking differently. So I would say there's both this energy awareness work that I do and this cognitive uh, recognition of diversity of styles that I do that really serves as fuel to the fire of people leaning into their um, I don't even like the word potential, right? Because potential implies trapped energy. So I think um, just leave it as cliche as it sounds, supporting people as they ignite their energy to just live a great life. I'm sitting here silent for a minute because I love the idea of supporting people so that they can live a great life. That, that idea of feeling worthy of living a great life kind of comes to me on that. What happens when people have resistance about that sort of thing, when they go, no, 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 that's not who I am. That's not what I really want to be about. But really, they do. You know, they really, they really, we all deserve to live a great life. But I'm sure that you 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 hit resistance from people you're working with. How do you handle that when that happens? It It really goes back to some basic psychology principles you know when people um are fearful of a situation because let's face it change is hard and you know we should say we're recording this in the midst of uh the covid pandemic and we're we're still you're in new york i'm in pennsylvania we're both still on stay at home order um so what generally happens is that many of us fear change we fear uncertainty mm -hmm. and we have a couple of responses and that kind of ties into that energetic um, piece that I was talking about, which is that oftentimes people, there are two core responses that people can have, probably three, but really there's that fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. um, and so coaching is all about figuring out if you are somebody who in the face of making a pivot is just, you're stuck. Like you just can't take a step forward. We talk about what the small wins would be for you in taking those small steps forward. Like change doesn't happen on a dime. It happens in small victories that we celebrate. And so it's, it's really critical to identify, are you somebody who's fighting that your intuition around potentially making a pivot? Are you somebody who's withdrawing from that? Or are you just literally frozen? Like you just are overwhelmed. Maybe you're suffering from analysis by paralysis. So 
again, the tools that I use are, you know, when we look at energy, we really get a sense of where people go under stress. Mm -hmm. And once we know where they go under stress, then we can help them. Um, you know, I can help people look at what those limiting beliefs are or blocks that they have might be to moving forward, getting out of that space, that catabolic energy and moving it up into what we call anabolic energy. Ooh, what, what's the difference between anabolic and catabolic energy? Well, ca catabolic is like negative juju, right? Uh -huh. It's like, um, it's people, I, it's totally normal and it's totally, there's no value to it. It's just, it tends to be destructive. Mm -hmm. um, it tends to be limiting. It tends to keep us stuck. And in that catabolic space, when we look at level one or level two energy, we look at both. Um, level one is around really withdrawing, going inward, disengaging, feeling like the victim, um, and feeling stuck. And then mm -hmm. level two is around conflict. So it has a little bit more zhuzh to it, right? Mm -hmm. Than level one, but it really creates a situation where, okay, I win, you lose. And then as you go into the different levels of anabolic energy, they start with, you know, at level three, we tolerate, at level four, we serve, at level five, there's a lot of opportunity, at level six, there's a lot of synergy, and level seven is just the zen place to be. And, and if you think about that, like our energy is um, a barometer, it, it's kind of like the stock market, it goes up and down throughout the course of a day. Mm -hmm. But once you can figure out what your patterns are, and you become conscious of them, and you can say like, Oh, okay, this is where I'm showing up. It's not really working for me right now. Then you can make the choice to move to a different, um, a different place. And that's where people experience change and they get to be fearless and courageous and uh, get to step into a place of choice. I love that. It, that makes me think of the word agency. When you feel ah. like you have agency, you can you know, you can make those changes and those pivots as, as needed, as you feel that you need them or want them, you can make those changes. And then I love what you said about synergy. I'd love to talk a little bit more about what that means, that place of synergy, when you are at that six doorway, I think you said, what is that? What is, what does it look like when you are in a state of synergy? Well, it connects really well to that creative mindset because level six energy is all about flow. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, um, I can never pronounce his name. I'm sure you probably can do a better job. Um, the guy who wrote flow, right. Talks about being in that space where you, all the parts come together. You're not struggling over all of those pieces, but there's something that happens with your energy where you literally lose track of time. Mm -hmm. You're in your sweet spot. You know, I like to think of it, of it as your sweet spot. And, Oftentimes it happens on different kinds of teams that we work on. I mean, it can happen for us as solopreneurs when we're connecting well with a client or mm -hmm. in our podcast mode where we totally lose track of time and we're just fully present. So level six is about that flow, feeling fully present. It's also about when you think about a creative mindset and you think about a team, it's really knowing how to bring whole brain thinking into play and really allowing people to use their best gifts collectively to get exponentially better results. Ooh, you've just said so much stuff that I want to unpack. <laughs> wow. Okay. So let me get this straight. When you're in that state of flow, mm -hmm. you're using something called whole brain thinking. And I really want to delve into what that means. And I love what you said about losing time when you're in that flow. And I, I, to me, when I talk about it with my clients, I talk about it in terms of different parts of the brain being stimulated. And the part of the brain that is most creative and artistic and uses those sort of conceptual uh, facets of thinking is not the timekeeper part of the brain. And the timekeeper part of the brain kind of has to sit, take a back seat when you are in that really creative mode. And so that's what I think of when I, when I think of that time loss where you're so present and so, you know, in the moment of creating whatever it is you're creating or doing whatever it is you're doing that you lose track of how much time has passed. And I've had that happen with conversations. I've had that playing music. I've had that, you know, making art that, 
that, oh, wait, where did the last two hours go? And it's because I was in that other part of my brain. Is that sort of what whole brain thinking is? I'd love for you to talk about what that means, especially how it applies to creativity and creative thinking. Yeah. So, so it's a very cool story. I actually learned this model. I was working for a global diversity and inclusion firm. And we were charged with trying to build a retention strategy for women of color at Pepsi. And when I went to go work for this company, I was all like Myers Briggs woman. You know, I thought that was just the the bomb. And they said, uh, no, we're going to use this tool called the whole brain thinking model. And the model is based uh, upon a lot of brain research uh, with a guy named Ned Herman, mm-hmm. uh, who worked for GE, uh, you know, at back in the days, the Jack Welch days and back in that area where they were in Croton and doing, they had that leader really basically like a leadership incubator. They were spending a lot of time and money on it, but he actually had a personal revelation sort of midlife. He, he had been an engineer. He had some sort of illness that, um, he was battling and he got really interested in art and, he was good at it and he was curious about the connection between being an engineer and being an artist. And it was around the time that we were sort of culturally beginning that conversation around left and right brain thinking. Mm -hmm. So he started there and then essentially the model looks at four quadrants of the brain. Um, It looks at it looks literally at that whole brain. And what he had done was he had connected EEGs to people and asked them a series of questions. And then what he would see is that certain parts of their brain would light up when those questions were asked. So there was, there's a lot of science behind it. A lot of, uh, all the things we love, like, you know, validity, reliability, huge, in my experiences, people were like, wow, this explains a lot. Um, but what we know is that there's basically, in this model, there are four ways of thinking. One, the upper left part of the brain is around uh, form. So it's the that analytical part of the brain, factual, um, very data-driven, analyzing. And then on the other side of the left brain, that lower left brain, is really in the weeds, um, very specific details, planner, organized, people who really love standard operating procedures uh, Mm -hmm. live over there. And then if we go to the right side of the brain, the lower right side of the brain is the feeling part of the brain um, where all those, you know, interpersonal skills live and uh, communication and intuition. Actually, intuition is an upper right brain um, in this intuition around people is in the lower right. And then the upper left is where, ta-da, um, the future part of the brain. It's where imagination and intuition and um, risk happen. And so there are the four quadrants. And then I think the other really cool thing about this model is he literally split the brain in half on the horizontal. And he talked about um, what's called cerebral thinking, which is really I like to use the camera uh, analogy. It's like the panoramic view. Mm -hmm. And then the lower part of the brain would be the um, limbic part of the brain, which is, you know, let's get in the weeds. Let's, let's, let's do it ourselves. Let's try to kind of get in there and, and play with it. So what we, what we know is that teams that are able to capitalize on whole brain thinking are exponentially more successful, um, more creative, create, they're able to generate different kinds of ideas because, and I'm sure this would be like a, like a year conversation for you and I, but, um, so many people have such a limiting belief about creativity, right? They think it's, they can think it's related to a product. Like I'm, I'm an artist, so I'm creative. If I'm not an artist, I'm not creative. Whole brain thinking allows anybody to think creatively because it just is like, okay, well, maybe it, you're a design engineer. And so you are thinking you are a, a, a cerebral thinker that thinks 
uh, on the left part of the brain. Uh, you could be, it, it just gives so much space for creativity and sure. reimagining creativity. Absolutely. And you know, it's really funny because I think innovation, ingenuity, those two words are creative in nature. They just are. And so when we look at them, when I think about, I worked at NASA for many years, and when I think about the scientists making great leaps at NASA, they were engaged in creative thinking in order to envision those possibilities to begin with. And so anytime, I agree with you, anytime I hear someone who is an accountant or who is a lawyer who says, well, I don't think creatively at all. That's not my bailiwick. I think, well, anytime you have an aha moment, there is, I think, creativity in action. So let me ask you, within that framework, when you're working with people who traditionally might say, oh, I'm not artistic, I'm not creative, that's not what I do, how do you, how do you bring them around? How do you get them to come around to think, well, maybe I could or maybe I already do? It's such a good question. And, and I'll just share a story um, with you that I think will make sense. So I was hired by um, an accounting firm to explore this issue of leadership. And the, um, I guess the management team, I think we call them the management team, were participating. They were both um, shareholders of the firm and emerging leaders. There's about 25 people in this group. And so we started with the, there's an assessment related to this whole brain model. So all of them took the assessment and then I was able to generate, um, it's a cool, very cool tool because I can generate a team profile. And this team, no surprise, like super left brained, right? I mean, fell down on the left side. They were, many of them were very much into what our, our traditional thinking on accountants, like, yeah, we need, we need to follow the rules and all this left brain thinking, um, or we, we just need to analyze the data. And what we really have been talking about is, yeah, those things are all in, are all very important in the tasks that you're doing, right? But in terms of leadership and in terms of iterating new ideas, you need to be able to at least have some core influencers who are willing to play on the right side of the brain. And so that's what we've really been working with. And ironically, we paired um, coaching and the HBDI with a program around anticipatory leadership. And it was all before um, COVID. And there was so much conversation about like, we don't change, we're accountants. We don't change, we're accountants. And now ironically, we've done all this work and, and I'm meeting with them again on Monday, but there's some people who are like, wow, look, we, we changed, we're capable of change. And um, we, we can be more innovative and we can go, we can create different business lines. And what whole brain thinking allows you to do is really ask yourselves, like you can do something called a whole brain audit, where you start generating questions from all four quadrants, which really encourage different thinking. Like at this firm, had they been off on their own, they would have just continued to ask the same questions. Mm -hmm. So whole brain thinking, when you know that you have a, a liability you can force yourself to get mindful about the kinds of questions that you ask so that you can generate different solutions. What does that mean? Force yourself to ask different questions and generate different solutions. How do you do that? Well, it, it's interesting because when uh, I'll take it from a cultural perspective. So if you're an accounting firm and you always start with the, uh, um, how we're going to do this, right? The, the what, um, you'll ask one set of questions, you know, what are the systems that we have in pl place? What's it going to cost us? What have we learned from past things? But what if you never ask the questions about how does this change impact people? How does this change impact um, the feelings of people on the team? Mm -hmm. um, or what, what are the questions around futures? So if you're living on that left side of the brain, you might not say, um, you might not even ask questions around the long view. 
the long view for you might be, uh, let's just get through tax season hmm. versus in three years, you know, who do we want to be as a firm? And um, what might it look like to be uh, an innovative, uh, best in practice firm? Um, how do we develop people, which is really at the core of what this firm came to me um, about. And we started at one place and we're ending up in sort of a different place with that. But if you are only asking yourselves the <clears throat> what and why questions, you won't get to the you won't get to the who's involved or the future questions. And so it it's very powerful to force yourself to ask the questions from a whole brain perspective. And when you're doing that, you are reaching for what in my mind is a, a concept rather than more of a, a linear justification for what's going on or what you're trying to achieve. Am I, am I on base or off base in that? No, you're totally on base. It becomes much more about the process versus the product, right? So we're so indoctrinated into having an end product, like even, you know, we could talk about something like brainstorming. People think, oh yeah, we did some brainstorming and we, we might've come up with three ideas. Well, literally what we really know is that when we use, when we take mind mapping or brainstorming or one of those tools and we go out to like the 50th iteration of something is really where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would say that that's, that would be my perception of that. That's so interesting. It's almost like uh, when you are first starting to brainstorm, there's a lot of self-judgment. There's a lot of, uh, oh, what if I'm doing this wrong kind of feelings? And there might even be some fear and resistance to actually unleashing all the possibilities. And it's only after you've done a few of them, or as you said, up to the 50, that you start to really feel free to come out with the craziest stuff that might just be so revolutionary that it changes everything. Yeah. And think about that from a cultural perspective. So it's, it, it takes somebody to be um, brave in a culture that's a left brain culture to be willing to ask the hard right brain questions and sure. it takes practice, right? I mean, we know so much about the brain that it's, uh, it's, a muscle and that we have neural pathways that we can build. Um, so it's interesting with that example that I was using about the firm, what we realized is we're going to really look for core influencers who are interested in thinking differently and do coaching for them rather than um, we were originally going to do like a mentor program for everybody. And mm -hmm. what we found was that sometimes in a culture like that, um, it can just be exhausting to pull everybody along. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're really looking for people who are bought into the idea mm -hmm. of um, thinking differently. And then I'm going to provide them the coaching support to get there so that they're able to, I guess, literally strengthen their voices around this. Sure. It's, I mean, early adopters, like looking at technology or something like that, people who are early adopters sort of buy their enthusiasm for what they're doing or what they're experiencing. They, they generate that spark for other people. And it sounds to me like that process of working with the influencers in the firm is actually going to help the other people see that it's okay, see that it's safe, and perhaps you know stick their toe in the water. So it sounds like a really valuable process for them to go through, and it's very wise of you to have thought of it. That's great. Yeah, I'm excited about it. That's so cool. So, so when you're doing this kind of work, you're doing it in a, in a company, these people are still working, tax season is coming up, all of that is happening. Let's talk about this idea of, of moving to a more creative, I mean, you know how close this is to my heart. <laughs> this is, you know, the Creative Mindset Podcast for, our, for Pete's sake, right? So, so this idea of moving away from, and I'm so tantalized by this, away from a left brain culture and perhaps more towards a right brain culture. What are your thoughts on that? Is it possible? 
are is are we in the in the in the beginning of that are we actually tasting the possibility there and moving there and if so how do you think that might go oh such a good question um well we we probably both i don't have you guys talked about daniel um pink on this have you talked about a whole new mind that book a whole new mind no i have uh what is it to sell as human uh that's i have on my on my shelf that i've read but i have not read a whole new mind yeah and i think what's cool about that book is he talks about the fact that as a as a society we have rewarded left brain behavior right mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. that's what we do like that's what school about is about we we unfortunately um, you know, we could talk about kindergartners and the enthusiasm they bring to learning and like me, 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 I'm curious, I'm going to ask questions. And as we go through that educational process, we are more tantalized by creating the product again, like we culturally, we're not very good at just leaning into a process. We have so mm -hmm. much stuff around creating a product and clearly like, yeah, products are important products generate revenue products, get us to where we need to. But there's something in that process piece that is really important. And I think between that and, I don't know if you're experiencing this, but I am certainly seeing this crisis. There's so much being written about the kind of leadership that's gonna be required mm -hmm. after COVID um, that we, have to get to that lower right brain thinking around feeling right what does empathy look like what does compassionate leadership look like um because we're literally living through a a collective trauma in the world right now i mean yeah. that on top of some other things right so how are we going to come out the other side of it is not going to be about the standard operating procedure that's in place. I mean, that might be part of it, but we are really going to have to learn how to work differently together. Mm -hmm. And many organizations, right, are finding that they need to make an organizational pivot to think about who they're serving and how their what their impact's going to look like. It's it's uh, remarkable the kinds of things that have happened in whatever day we are in this versus what people thought they were capable of doing, right? So many organizations like my accounting firm was, oh my gosh, we could never work from home. Zoom meetings, that we could never do that with our clients, right? So, but we learn because as humans, we are learners. We, and we're adapters that I, I do think that we have this amazing opportunity right now to lean into um, a different set of skills around adaptability, flexibility, compassion, mm -hmm. innovation, creativity. All of those things are going to become much more powerful for leaders to be able to um, learn and and really lean into. Um, in the next iteration of whatever corporate culture is going to look like. I completely agree with you, and I hope that you are right. The, uh, you know, and it's interesting, I, I was looking up uh, the top skills that companies want of prospective new employees, like the top 10 skills, the top five skills, and everybody lists creativity, if not number one, then in, in the top five of mm -hmm. skills that they want from prospective new employees, from prospective new hires. So it's interesting that that this idea, it looks like it's getting some traction. You know, what you're talking about this, this we're, we're changing, and I don't like the word paradigm because it's such a buzzword, but it really is. The way we're doing things, the paradigm seems to be shifting. But I have a, I have a question about that because, and this is, this is a strange one and it's out of left field and I apologize if it's a little odd, we thought after 9-11 that things would change. We thought that things would radically become different. And they kind of didn't. You know, so many things stayed after things sort of calmed down and we, and we grieved. A lot of the practices that, that had been going on September 10th, 2001 came back. 
Mm-hmm. And the same with 2008 when we went through the the housing crisis and and the recession and everything, and we thought, oh, things are going to be different, but they kind of aren't. And so, what are your thoughts on this? Is COVID and we're in it now, and things 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 have changed, but but will they remain changed when? when we're allowed to congregate together again, when it's safe, when people are able to be healthy and doing that, when we get back to working perhaps the the same, perhaps a different way than we used to, do you think we'll slide back? Or do you think that this has been a real turning point and things are going to move forward very differently from now on? Ah. Uh, I'm going to, I, I'm bite. I'm like, my tongue is bleeding because, <laughs> <laughs> because we have all of this opportunity mm-hmm. and I don't want to go political, but we're living in a world that I think that the barrier right now is around leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think we're going to have to step up as leaders in our, you know, right now we're in our house bubble. And I was, I talk to my husband about this all the time, right? We're like in our little, our little insulated bubble. And then we have our neighborhood bubble and then we're going to go back out to our, whatever those bubbles look like. And then um, hopefully someday we'll go back to this much more global bucket. I mean, we're all in a global crisis, but I, what I hope my only hope is that people make the choice in the bubbles that they can impact to step up and be a force for good. Um, I I agree with uh, your question is such a good one. And I have had this conversation with people, you know, I have a brother who's a very successful businessman who's we've been talking about um, this in contrast to nine 11. And he's like, this is going to be nothing like nine 11. Um, It's, you know, it'll take us five years at least to financially recover from this. And, Mm -hmm. you know, but I also think that what I'm challenging people to do right now, and I hope that they do is do what I call a COVID audit, which means have everybody in your company, in your bubbles, start to make a list of all the things that have changed since they've been at home just make a list, just, you know, okay, so I'm spending more time in Zoom, I'm spending less time with this, I've been able to connect with people this way, just just generate, brainstorm that list. And then when the list is created, take, uh, I love colorful magic markers, right? Um, (laughs) Me too. Yeah, I thought you might. So like take a red marker and put all the things on that list that you will be glad to see go away right? Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're just not, they're a net negative. And then take a green pen and make with that list, circle all the things that like are better. Like they're better. We're doing something better and it's working. Mm -hmm. Um, And we want to keep, and we're going to celebrate them. And maybe we're going to be able to take them and we're going to be intentional about them. And then there's this sort of, let's call it a yellow area where there's a bit of uncertainty whether we're gonna literally stay and move into a new way of doing a business Mm -hmm. and i think one of the cool things that can happen is that companies can start to become more intentional and say with with doing that audit if individuals do it and then i see coming back together as a team as a very good follow-up and you know creating post-its in a room and saying like yeah we did this or we did that. Like some of my clients, I work with a couple of mental health agencies and what they've realized is they've been able to, they've spent less time on travel, more time, even though it's Zoom time, they've been able to be much more face-to-face with people. So I think the idea of doing this audit and then following it up and being intentional about what you've learned is where it will as we trainers and facilitators like to say, have some more stick. If we just are like, yeah, that happened, right? What's the story we want to tell after this? What is the story we want to tell after this? And be intentional about it. We might find ourselves seeing, we might be able to see some sustainable change. 
I hope again, once again, I hope that you are right. And I love this idea of what's the story we want to tell about this. Some of this to me is that we we need to feel empowered to tell our story, whatever that is. And we need to feel empowered to to even think it, to even process through some of what's happening and and take again agency and ownership of our destiny in this way. I mean, yes, we're 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 all workers in one way or another, but the thought that I'm having is, for example, teleworking, it the employees can now, I, I remember when I worked at NASA, teleworking was not possible. It just wasn't possible. And then actually a friend of mine became the person who was the first teleworker. He worked at Goddard Space Flight Center at NASA, but he was actually living in Chicago and he was the first one. It was a huge deal. And for a long time, NASA was, uh, they were hesitant to have people do that. But now with COVID, we've had millions of people working from home and being productive and, and being ingenious with what they're doing so that now they the employees themselves can ask for it if that's what they want to do. But then I think it's up to leadership to to accept it and think differently enough to say, yes, that's that's what we're that's what we want. That's we're we're gonna okay this because it worked so well during a time when we had to do it. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that leadership is up for the task for something like that? Well, I think insightful, powerful leaders who <laughs> um, have empathy and can see that people have agency. Uh, you know, it, it's so funny, right? I, I've had I've had coaching clients who come to me specifically because they are very burnt out or stressed out. They're leading big teams and they haven't been able to delegate. Well, guess what? Guess what happened during COVID? They they had to leave their bag of micromanagement behind and mm. they had to entrust their teams in different ways. And so that feels really freeing for people. So, you know, unfortunately, we're still very much a what's in it for me culture. So if we can figure out what's in it for me and be able to have been successful during this time, I think we have a much better case for some of that change. Um, and I do think that we have to, we have to look at leadership, not from a top down approach. We really have to look at leadership from a, a expansive, um, everyone is a leader perspective and more than ever, everyone is a leader and we have to have agency of thought and we have to be able to be, um, we have to celebrate those things. I mean, in some ways, I think you and I can agree that what's happened to us as a culture is we, I don't know if it's that we're just culturally are experiencing multiple traumas, but we're, we sort of are building this Teflon shield around ourselves, right? So again, without getting political, like we're today, we're dealing with this horror of the, the situation of what the criminal justice is all about. Mm. So many people have become like we're immune to images, we're immune to pain, we're like, we're Teflon. We we watch it and we're, what's so fascinating is we're not, our feelings, I think we're numb in some ways to mm. these feelings. And I think it's only when we become more vulnerable and we allow ourselves to feel that pain that we're gonna literally be able to change. And I was watching, the news last night and I, like I literally started crying mm -hmm. and I just like we're hurting people are hurting and what we choose to do with the hurt that's happening now will be the story that we tell after this all of this yeah yeah I, and I I so appreciate you saying that about about starting to weep I did this, I was crying last night too. And my husband is like, you need to stop with the news because it's impact you, impacting you too much. And I quote 
Rob Roy. Have you ever seen that movie? No. Oh, it's a it's a movie with Liam Neeson and Jessica Lange a uh, number of years ago, and uh, there's a there's a character who gets raped, and somebody her husband's best friend finds out that this happened and he's like, I have to tell him. And she said, you will not tell him because if he finds out, he'll go and kill him and then he'll be killed. And she said the words, if I can bear to have it happen, you can bear to be silent. And that, that line, that moment blew me away because what I, I've transmogrified it a little bit. And I say, if, if they can ha bear to have it happen, I can bear to be witness. I can bear to, to be there and I can bear to have compassion. So that's my, that's how I've transformed that line from the movie. I, I, I call them teleparables where movies just bring something in. And, and the same thing for you and me, we, you know, when we feel this and we allow ourselves to feel it, then compassion has to overflow because there's no other way. You know, there's no other way for people who have any sort of compassion to be right now. They have to have compassion and they're going to feel. And the issue that I'm having so much right now is that feelings tend to get a bad rap, you know, that, that when you explore, express your emotion, then you're just too sensitive. And I want to see that change more. I want to see us all, every single one of us be able to be in our feelings and, and, you know, have them and express them. And I wonder what your thoughts are on where we are with respect to our emotions, our feelings, that, that part of us that, that doesn't even have words for what we're feeling in our brain, but that feels so deeply, but so often also feels like it has to hide those feelings. And um, I think in some ways we're fortunate that we're seeing an emergence in, in pop culture um, of some very authentic voices mm -hmm. starting to bubble up as thought leaders and people who, women who are getting, um, you know, Brene Brown, uh, the goddess Brene Brown, right? I was in a book club, I mean, I participated in a book club a couple of weeks ago where that was the, Dare to Lead was, I highly recommend that book, by the way, mm -hmm. um, where we were talking about Dare to Lead. And it was fascinating because there was, there was, might have been a man or two on that call who was like, I didn't like this book at all. Right. So it's hard. There are, there's a lot of gender stuff going on about mm -hmm. vulnerability, authenticity. We have pop culture people like a Rachel Hollis or, um, you know, Gabriella Bernstein, or, I mean, I'm reading Untamed, which is literally like the most powerful book I've read in a very long time. That is part of this becoming part of a global conversation mm -hmm. about how, how we're choosing to show up. And, you know, I think that we're giving the whole movement of being perfectly imperfect and being vulnerable, there's some good stuff happening. It's it's not it, it's not quieting down that noise because my God, we have so much loudness right now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we literally have people. We have a screamer right now, and so it's it's hard. But I think people are seeking that, and so if if we can be intentional about finding others who can join us in this courageous conversation to me that's where i think we're going to see transformation happen it's we don't need to have a shouting match we need to have a listening circle it's just i don't know that that's how it is i think you're i think you're right and that idea of listening is so important. You know, it's funny. I was asked by a prospective client to send them some video of some of the work I've done. And I, I said something along the lines in a, in a, in a communication uh, workshop that I was doing that, that, you know, it, if we can see the people on the other side of the aisle, if you will, if we can see them, if we can listen to them, if we can understand them, if we can know them, then there is no way that we can be indifferent to them. Mm -hmm. And 
the question then becomes how do we how do we unveil the importance of something like this how do we how do we educate other people on how crucial this this skill of empathy is what what are the steps what are what are your thoughts on that well i think we have to name it and we have to claim it and we have to practice it and we have to create space for people uh to have those kinds of experiences and you know you and i both are do coaching and coaching is like that's the space in my life where i really work with people on having those conversations um and i i don't i don't see any other way out of this except through it and through one person being willing to be vulnerable and that one person taking it to their team and that team taking it to their uh leadership and the leadership taking it to their professional association you know in the workspace and on the personal space it's just deciding to show up in maybe a different room than you usually play in i mm. don't know um it's it's very heavy lifting and i i do think it's you know how do we talk to each other how do we speak to each other how do we how do we bring civility back to the conversation mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of weird right we have this culture where these a lot of these influencers are popping up that are giving us very affirming positive messages layered into some of our structures becoming just very noisy and disruptive and hierarchical so mm -hmm. it it's a i don't know it's just a fascinating it's it's a fascinating perplex question that maybe you know you and i should commit to trying to solve and boy we would be like selling a lot of books and <laughs> making a lot of uh doing a lot of speaking because i hate to think about well i guess we could think about it like this what does a win-win look like right right now we're still in such a win-lose paradigm of life and mm -hmm. if we start to think about abundance versus scarcity and win-wins then we might be able to have a different conversation i i, I think you're i think you're right on that and and yet that that shift, that shift. And I come back to, you know, I named this podcast, The Creative Mindset, and that shift in mindset would, would help, you know, looking at how, how you view things and deciding consciously to look at what's good rather than what's not and look at what's positive rather than what's not and look at, look towards abundance rather than towards lack. You know, I have a little note above my computer on my, on my desk that says, it just says two words, well, three actually, it says bounty and abundance. And mm -hmm. whenever, whenever I start going into the, into the underside of that, I remember, I look at that note and I remind myself that, that that is, even if I don't always get there, I'm always trying to, you know, and especially right now during COVID when I'm spending an inordinate amount of time at my desk, um, you know, and, I, and I'm blessed that I love what I do, but still a lot of my time is here. And, yeah. and so having that reminder, and so, and I tell that to all my coaching clients, actually, I say, I say that very thing, put up post-it notes everywhere in your house, remind yourself to, to be, on the upside of that rather than on the downside. And, and for my motorcycle riders, I say, you know, keep the rubber side down and the shiny side up. And it's, it's so important. And yet many of us, you know, there are a lot of people who are afraid and there are a lot of people who are making changes. And I, I want people to make changes based on deciding to pivot, deciding that it's time. And so that brings me to another question that I really wanted to get your thoughts on many of us during this time are reinventing ourselves we're, we're 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 taking the time to learn to grow to build new skills and i think it might even lead people to changing jobs or even careers you know just because they're like you know what i've been spending this time thinking and i when when life gets going again as far as 
going outside and all of that, I'm not sure I'm going to want to do what I've been doing. And so what are your thoughts on that? How, how do you think people are doing that? And how might someone reinvent themselves by engaging that creative thinking part of their brain? I definitely think that's happening. Uh, I was very, I was curious and nervous about how all this would affect, you know, the people that I'm working with or would it affect or would people just, well, I didn't know what the outcome would be. What I'm finding is I'm getting an influx of clients who are saying they've really done some of the me work during this time and they've uncovered something and they want to go further with that exploration, mm-hmm. um, whether it's professionally. But let's face it, you know, there there are there are men and women who've had this. It, I hate to use the word unprecedented because I saw Jim Gaffigan on uh, CBS this morning talk about the overuse of the word unprecedented, right? But um, unprecedented time with their families to be with their children like i it brings me so much joy to see like my neighborhood be alive and i just feel that people might be willing to ask for more of their leaders and their employers in saying you know maybe i can come in two days a week um and work from home three days a week or I've been thinking about a new initiative while we've been um, at home and I want to bring it to the table or, you know, I've had enough space to think about the fact that this isn't really where I'm finding joy and I do want to make a shift. So again, one of the most powerful questions is, and you're a storyteller, that's what you do, right? So Mm -hmm. To me, the lesson in this is, you know, when we think about people and their stories and we look at people who've gone through other hardships, whether it's people who've been through health adversity or, you know, you're thinking about your grandparent who's telling the story about the depression. We have a choice in the story that we tell when this is done. And what is the story that you personally want to share with your children or your grandchildren or your nieces or your nephews? like? I know I don't want to be telling a story of, yeah, it was miserable. Like I didn't get to see anybody. And, um, you know, I, I just crawled up and rolled into a ball. Like, that's not the story that I'm going to choose to tell about this. And I chose pretty quickly where I wanted to make that pivot. And, and it's not just because I'm a, co- a coach. It's because I do believe that the gift that we have as human beings is agency. And we need to lean into that and, and be excited about it and, and steer that story in a way that's powerful and can make the world just a little bit better of a place. Amen. (laughs) Absolutely. You know, and it's funny, what you just said is so interesting. It's about choice. You know, it's about choosing what you're going to feel and how you're going to react. Like, I see, here's the thing. I, I think, honestly, for me, how I feel happens, but how I choose to respond to what I'm feeling is entirely on me. Yep. You know? And so, so within that framework, something that you said really struck me. And you said we learn by experiences. So what do you think collectively people are learning from this experience? What do you think we can learn and how can we do it on purpose? How can we take that, that idea of this is what I'm going to learn and, and, and make it purposeful. I think people are learning that they're more than their jobs. Um, I think people are learning that they can live more simply. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that people are learning that gratitude is very powerful. Um, I think we're learning how to communicate differently. Uh, I think that we're learning that we all crave human interaction. Um, and we are, 
we're much we can we can be patient we can be persistent we can support each other um through all of this so i would say those would be just the things that come top of mind to me uh, those are fabulous things i i i'm like i could talk more about that but i think you've just said it all right there. <laughs> right there mm -hmm. so so i want to shift gears a little bit if that's okay sure and i want to talk to you about your podcast because i was just on it and i was honored to be a guest recently what prompted you to start thinking courageously and what is your goal with it oh um well what prompted me was partly i mean you you were a definite prompt me uh, you because you do it and you're, oh. you're always like i'm very inspired by you um i'm so honored thank you yeah and you were doing it at this conference we were at two years ago you were ahead of the curve girl um <laughs> and um i wanted to find a space where i could really share lots of stories about women who are successful women who are finding the courage to make pivots and i'm having such a good time with it and like i know you experienced this with your podcast but all of a sudden i'm i'm having like totally different conversations with people mm -hmm. and um i just wanted i i want to create this like archive this space where at some point any woman can find a hero in these stories that we're telling through the podcast that will give them that will help ignite them that might change their life that might help them think courageously that might help them make that pivot and we have had such limiting def definitions as women of success around success that i just think that it's so cool like you know you are this nasa person and the person who is um, on the podcast today has an amazing story about um growing up in jerusalem an ultra orthodox family and the courage it took to leave that and you know i have business people and i have health people like courage shows up in such different ways and mm -hmm. success is defined in such different ways so i love the idea of like people connecting with that story um and feeling that they see something in another person that is inspiring to them mm, that's lovely and 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 the podcast is great i i listen to it and i love it i love it love it love it it's always it's always eye-opening to me and always thought-provoking which which is what i look for <laughs> from podcasts is do you make me think yes yes deb you definitely do Abs no absolutely I, I love i love your perspective and i love your relationships with your guests I, I think check out her podcast it's awesome that's that's what i have to say about that and i wanted to ask you just a few more questions i know you and i could talk all day but i know we both have lives that we that you that we need to get back to and i know you've got a busy work day ahead uh and i'm going to be teaching a singing class in a little bit so there you go <laughs> because that's the kind of thing i do yeah so so um if you this is a this is a little this is a little odd question but i'm going to ask it when you encounter fear or its cousin resistance in in a in a workshop you're doing how do you address it with the with both the individuals and in the groups i something i'm curious about and i know it's out of left field and it's a different part of the conversation but there's something in here that i really want to explore just a minute how do i address the issue of fear yeah, because when you're doing a workshop and you're asking someone or or a group of people to do something that you that they're that you can obviously tell that they're fearful about, you know, that there's something that's sparking fear or resistance, how do you handle it? What do you do? Like how do you think creatively in that moment to get them through it? Well, I, I in the work that I do, right? Well, we will talk about things like limiting beliefs or gremlins or um what's the story you're telling yourself versus mm -hmm. the reality of something and i think the question of how is 
that meaning whatever choice you're making now serving you mm -hmm. um, is such a powerful question. Um, so when we show up in fear and we ask, how is it serving me? Usually people are able to, a lot of times I hear it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then, then, okay. So with that being said, what are some of the small, small pivots that you can make to play in a space that creates discomfort for you. Like, again, it, it doesn't have to be a 360 pivot. It can just be, I'm going to take a new action and I'm going to practice that action every day. And mm -hmm. it can be something so small, right? Mm -hmm. But it, when people get into action, they usually feel that they can start to think about what, is on the other side of fear. And that is so powerful right there. And and it's in action that I think we get to the place where we can start looking at that. Because the second you move in any direction, everything changes, whether or not you thought it would. So so it's fascinating that that, that moment of moving in some direction, no matter how small the move is, will allow you to ask that question. And I think that's great. I, I tell my clients, big breaths, small steps. That's oh, I my, love that. that's, I my love that. that's my mantra for most of my clients because people think they have to make every change right now, and that's just not true. So I wanted to ask you a couple, of, a couple more questions. Uh, do you have any resources that you can recommend for people who want to learn about courageous thinking or whole brain thinking? Are there, is, are there books that people can read? Is there, is, are there videos, anything like that that we can put in the show notes? Um, I can, the company that is really the, uh, leaders in this area, the name of that company is Herman H E R M A N N, uh, international. Mm -hmm. And they have a website that has, uh, some great resources. Certainly people can check with me. I actually haven't found like the quintessential book. I, I think Daniel Pink's work is really good around, um, thinking differently. Um, certainly anything with the question of, you know, why um, asking powerful questions, uh, appreciative inquiry, all of those things I think are great. Um, but I, I actually don't have like one resource. I, okay. I have things that people are interested in. Uh, they can contact me through my website and I'm happy to send some things. I, I want to say one other thing about this model, it is super powerful model to work in a corporate setting around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, because thinking differently is a space where people are generally more open to the conversation around diversity um, mm -hmm. than in other spaces. And that's why this firm that I had worked with chose that tool. Yeah. And that right there, I think is a super powerful testament to to what this this method can do. And it's actually, just so you know, if you're listening, thinkherman.com, think, the word think, and then H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N.com is the, uh, it's, uh, let's see, what is it called? It's something about cognitive, cognitive diversity, maximize your talent by harnessing cognitive diversity is, is sort mm -hmm. of their, their catch-all. So I think it's, that sounds like a, like a, brilliant thing. And you've already mentioned through your website, let me ask just a little bit more. If people want to, um, if companies or organizations might want to hire you to ignite their people, if people want to follow you on social media, where should they find you? What is the best place? Is it through your website or do you have other social media accounts that they could follow and find you on? Well, you know us solopreneurs. Um, so my website is the Think Good Company, www.thethinkgoodcompany. And you can find me in the universe in Think Good Company on uh, Facebook and on Instagram. Um, and my LinkedIn is under, I believe it's Deborah Cummins Stilato. Um, so I'm in all those places. I'd love to continue the conversation. You and I need to like, uh, figure out how we're going to, you know, 
turn the world upside down together. That sounds um, fabulous. <laughs> yeah, let's just do it. Um, so yeah, all of those ways. And um, I would love to, to keep the conversation going. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we're going to have to, we're going to have to figure out how to, how to empower the world here. I think that's the, um, <laughs> with on your market tech go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so before I, before I let you go, I have one question that I ask everybody who comes on the show and I would love to ask it of you. It's a, it's a simple yet challenging one. Okay. And it is this, if you had a plane that could skywrite something for everyone in the world to see, what would you say? Mm. That is such a good question. I would say believe. Can it just be one word? Of course, it, it's it's your skywriting. <laughs> it's what it's whatever. I, I like the word believe. It came just came to me because I just think that when we have belief and we believe in ourselves and we believe, um, we can do great things. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it would be believe, think differently. There you go. Or think differently, believe something. Like that. <laughs> I do think that we have to, you know, in order to believe, we oftentimes have to cha change the paradigm of our thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think right there, that idea of change, we get back right to creativity. It's, it's that, that, uh, that ability to envision something different than what is, Mm -hmm. is creative in nature. And that is something that is so powerful because we tend to discount it, but it cannot be discounted. Not anymore. We're, things are changing and uh, we can change with them or, you know, there will be really tough times ahead. So I think this idea of envisioning something different and allowing yourself to accept it is powerful beyond measure. Let's believe it. Let's believe yeah, seriously. That's that's it. We're and and scene back to my theater days. So, Deb, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. You are beyond fabulous. Such wisdom that you have shared. I'm so grateful to you that you that you participated with such presence and such heart and such wisdom. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. It was so much fun. Um it, it's uh, so great to be with you and it's such an amazing podcast that you have and the, you. all the work that you're doing is, is just joyful and your storytelling, all of it, so many amazing things. So it's just great fun to be in your presence and very inspiring. Oh, right back at you. This is a mutual admiration society. I yeah. love it. <laughs> so thank you again, Deb. And this is the Creative Mindset Podcast. Once again, I'm Isolde Trachtenberg. If you enjoyed today's episode, find Deb Cummins Stilato. Follow her. If you own a company and you need leadership training, she is the woman. She's the woman who'll help you get things done. And I am so grateful to her and to you for sharing this time it's so important right now for us to think differently, for us to think with that ingenuity, that innovation, that creativity that lets us get inspired and run with the changes that we want to make in our lives. This is the time. Now is the place. We're here. Let's, let's do it. That's really the best way. If you're liking what you hear, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to the podcast and comment and let me know what you're thinking are there things that you'd love to hear more about? Are there different kinds of creative thinking subjects that are, that are piquing your curiosity? Drop a line, let me know. I'd love to know all about it. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I send you all of my love. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2020. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, this is Zolda Trachtenberg and I send you all of my love.